In this video, I'm going to go through solutions to part 061, Exercises Boolean. Link to that document is in the video description. As with all the exercises, I suggest that you do these ahead of time before going through this solution video. All the code that I show in this video is going to work perfectly in Octave as it's shown here in MATLAB. All right, exercise one, create variables named a and b and give the variables vector values such that b is greater than or equal to a. Both variables must have at least three different values. So MATLAB lets us create and compare vectors very, very easily in a way that other programming languages do not. I'm gonna keep this real simple. So if my a vector is one, two, three, and we want b to always be greater than or equal to a, I'm gonna do one, four, five. And then we should test it out, let's compare them. So is b greater than or equal to a? We get one, 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 which indicates true, true, true. So true in all situations. As with many MATLAB operators, the comparison is done element-wise. What is displayed by the following code, a or b? So we have a vector named x and we have a scalar value named y. We wanna check if x is less than y. And what MATLAB is gonna do is, it's gonna compare each and every value in x to this value, this 10 right here. But the way if works, it's only counted as true if every single result is true. And it's not true in this case right here for the second value in X. So B is going to display and we can run it and verify that. There it is. What is displayed by the following code, A, B, C, or D? Try to answer without running it. So we're doing an AND between the vectors V and T. And the way AND works is that the overall result is true if both inputs are true and one is counted as true and zero is counted as false. So it's gonna be false, 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 true. So D is the correct answer here, and we can run it and see that that is what we get. What is displayed by the following code, A, B, C, or D? So this time, instead of doing an AND, we're doing an OR between the two vectors, and I believe it's the exact same data. And the way OR works is the overall result is true if the first input is true, or the second is true, or both. So false and false reports false, but true and false reports true, false and true reports true, true and true also reports true. So it's gonna be B right here and we can run it and verify. Find and display the row and column indexes of all the values in X less than or equal to 10. So X is a matrix right here. And if we want all the row and column indexes, then I need to create a vector of two values and set it equal to the result of find X less than or equal to 10. And there we go. So in row one, column one, there is a value less than or equal to 10, this one right here. In row two, column one, right there, there's another value. In row one, column two, so the 10 is of course less than or equal. Row two, column two, the eight right here. And then lastly, row one, column four, the six is the only remaining value where this is true. So the find can be used to get vectors of row and column values, as well as other uses uh, that we've seen in the video series. Copy out all the values in X between 30 and 80 into a new vector named values. So we'll set values equal to the X values where 30 is less than X and X is less than 80. And there are those values right there. 42 and 78 are the only two qualifying values. This is not the only way to do this, but I think it is probably the cleanest way to do it. The question doesn't really specify inclusive or exclusive. So if you use less than or equal to, uh, that could also be considered correct, um, but I chose to do it this way. We're getting from X, and this right here is gonna give us a true false matrix. In fact, let's actually just run that in the command window, right? A matrix of true and false values, but they are going to be true where these conditions are true and they're gonna be false everywhere else. And we can use that to index into the original matrix X here and extract out only those true values. Write code to determine how many values in X are less than 10 or greater than 50. So in this one, we're just trying to count up how many values meet the criteria. So there's a variety of ways to do this as well. I think the easiest way is to just sum up X less than 10 or X greater than 50, which I'm gonna express as 50 less than X because this right here is again gonna produce a bunch of ones and zeros, and we'll just add up the trues, we'll add up the ones. Now, a more cumbersome way you could do it, although this will work, is what is the length of find the values? So find will produce a vector of indexes, positions where this is true, 
and we'll just get the length of that. So when I run it, I'm gonna get two duplicate results. No, I'm not, because I messed that up. The sum right here is summing over a matrix, right? This right here is a matrix of true false values, right? We see a matrix right there, and the sum operates on a per column basis. So actually what you need to do is a sum over the sum, and now it'll be correct. So actually, either way, it's, it's not too different in these. I believe this is slightly more efficient, though. The following code reports what? Select an option, A, B, or C. So here we have a vector, and we're going to find where that vector is equal to 77. Now, the real question is, what does find return? And the answer is A, the location or index of 77, which in this case is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five. It does not return 77. It does not return true or false. It returns the position or index. If you think of the vector as a street and each of these numbers lives at a particular house number, 8 lives at house number 1, 2 lives at house number 2, 1 lives at house number 3, 1 lives at house number 4, and 77 lives at house number 5, it is returning the house number. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. The following code reports what? So we have two vectors here, they're spaced out so the numbers line up, and we're getting the index where the 77 lives in x, but we're applying that index to the vector y. And what this is meant to illustrate is the position in one vector can be used in a different vector, and it's a fairly common thing to do. What we're going to end up with is the 55, because it lives at the same index in the neighboring vector. So we're going to get the number 55b, and there it is. Complete the following program. If velocity is greater than 100, then increment velocity by 50. When I say increment, what I mean is add a number to the value of velocity. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It doesn't say to display velocity at the end, but I figure I might as well do it. All right, and then I run it, enter a value for velocity, 40. And it just says 40, because 40 is not greater than 100, so there's no change. If I run it again and enter 120, well, now I get 170 because 50 more is added to the velocity. Write a program to check if AMP1 and AMP2 differ by more than 0.5. If so, display the values of AMP1 and AMP2. Just because the instructions use the word AND does not necessarily mean that the ampersand is used. Now, I give you a lot of this solution because the way to find the difference is actually this right here. All right, so we're going to write if this is greater than 0.5, and that is the difference with the absolute value there to make sure it's positive. All right, so amp one is gonna be one, amp two is gonna be two, and we display them out because the difference is greater than 0.5. And if I run it again and do 0.1 and 0.2, nothing displays because their difference is not greater than 0.5. Write a program that does the following. If the cube root of the try variable is less than 1.5, display the value of try. All right, and then there's a variety of ways to calculate it. All right, we'll run it here, uh, 1,000. All right, displays nothing because the cube root is not less than 1.5. Run it again, 2. Cube root of 2 is less than 1.5, so we will display try right there, which is the 2. These are just little exercises in ifs. All right, this next one, though, is a little bit bigger. Write a nested if-else, or set of else-ifs, to implement the following logic. All right, and the logic is in this little table right here. Basically, we have two variables. We have amps and we have voltage. And if the voltage is low and the amps are low, then we display this. If the voltage is low but the amps are high, we display this. If the voltage is high and the amps are low, we display this. If the voltage is high and the amps are high, we display this. There's a variety of ways to do this. I'm going to type out both of them. The first is going to use nested ifs and elses. So I actually messed this up as I was typing it. I didn't need this if right here. This if is taken care of by this else, and I was just going on autopilot and just typing stuff in. This is not needed, and I wouldn't want you to do it. So the basic idea is we can determine which of these two columns we're in, whether we're in the low voltage category with these two options or we're in the high voltage category with these two options. So we first check low voltage. That means we're either here or we're here. So we have another if else nested inside of this if with just one amps check. 
And if the amps are low, we display this, and otherwise we display high amps. And that's all we need to worry about there. I don't need this if because the else is automatically taking care of that for me. Now my indentation got all messed up here, but that's okay, I can fix that. And in fact, when I typed in end and noticed that it was still indented, the second end really, that was what clued me in to the fact that I've messed something up. So the else right here is inherently the other condition, the high voltage condition right here, because we only reach the else if this is false. And the only way for this to be possible is if this is voltage is not less than 150. It has to then be greater than or equal to. So then for that category, we will check low amps. And if so, we'll print out low amps right there. Great. Otherwise, the only situation left is hot circuit. I don't have to check if the amps are high. I know that that's the only remaining situation. So this is the nested way to solve this question. And we can run it and just, I'm going to put in ludicrous values, really high values. Great, so that's the high values hot circuit. And you can test out all the other ones as well. Now there is another way to do it. And I'm gonna start with this code and kind of collapse it down to show you that alternative. So we can say if the voltage is less and the amps are less, then we can skip to right here. Now we do need more conditions in this situation because now I need to say else if, and we'll check if the volts are low and we'll check if the amps are high. So instead of less than or equal to, we'll check greater than, and then we'll display out high amps. I'm gonna get rid of the end because now I need to check else if amps are low and we'll print low amps, else it has to be the high one. I don't need to check voltage here. I've checked low voltage and low amps. I've checked low voltage and high amps. The only other situation is that voltage must be high. And that must be true for any of these cases down here. Now it wouldn't hurt to type it in. It wouldn't hurt to put in there uh, voltage greater than or equal to with an and, but I do want to emphasize that it is not necessary. And then the else right here, well, this is the only situation that could be possibly remaining. I'm only using the quotation marks, by the way, because I was lazy and just copying them out of here. Single quotes, um, I think are better personally and doesn't really make a difference, but this will also work. MATLAB is warning me about the ampersands right here uh, not being ideal. Technically, I should probably use the double ampersands because I'm only comparing scalar values. I'm not comparing vectors, but I encourage folks to just be simple and just use the single ampersands because it works in every situation. And then you don't have to worry about the complexity. Continuing on down. So this one is gonna ask us to write a function. And in that function, we're gonna have some ifs and else ifs to determine what stage a rocket is in. This is just the setup right here. And it's asking us to write a function named which rocket stage. So I'm gonna copy that and open a new tab. Started off with the word function right here. I don't remember what my return variable context is. I'm gonna have to look that up, but I'm just gonna name it result for now and set it equal to which rocket stage, just like that, parentheses. And there are some inputs and I believe the input is seconds, but I'm gonna have to remind myself and then I'll end it with end. I'm gonna go back to the other document and I'm just gonna copy this in so I don't have to keep looking it back up. And let's paste it in right here. Okay, so the first rocket stage is going to be 0 to 100 seconds inclusive. There is something set equal to our rocket, so I'm going to assume that we're returning a numeric value, the numeric value of the stage. Yeah, I should have looked at this more carefully here. All right, so we are returning a result. It's going to be the numeric value of the stage. So instead of displaying, we will set result equal to 1. And that's our if. Else if the rocket is in stage 2. Between these, inclusive. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, but actually all I need is seconds less than or equal to 170. Now there's actually some debate here. Is this sufficient or is it not? What if a negative value is entered? And in fact, since it says throw an error if a negative value is entered, I wanna be a little bit more careful with this. I think this can be a fine thing to do, but what I should really do if that's what I want is I should start off checking for improper inputs. If seconds is less than zero, I should throw an error. And by the way, there is a built-in MATLAB function named, I believe it's named error. Yeah, named error, and I can display improper input to my function. And we'll see what happens with this. I'll test this out in a second. Now I need to change this if to an else if. I don't need to check this anymore. I don't need to check this anymore because I can't even get into this condition. I can't even check these 
uh, true false values without having gotten past this guard. And the only way to get past this one is for this to be false. Now, if this is false, this has to be true. This one doesn't necessarily have to be true, but this one does. So we can just get rid of it. And that simplifies things. All right, so then we're in stage one. Else if seconds is less than 170, I don't have to check that it's greater than 100. That's implied. Result equals two. And finally, beyond that, for all further values of seconds, result equals three. And we can just end it right there. All right, so I think I did that right. I'm going to save it. I'm going to use the suggested save name, which is correct. We need to save our file in the exact same name as the function name. So which rocket stage dot M, which rocket stage is the function. And now let's go see if this works. Let's run it. All right, I'm going to enter an improper value. And look, I've generated an error. You can do that with your own code with this error function right here. You can say error, and then what would you like displayed out? And that text is displayed out right there. All right, now let's run it again and enter uh, 10 seconds. So that's stage one, perfect. Run it again, how many seconds since launch? Um, 120. Stage two, run it again, 400 seconds. Oops, whoops. Run it again over here. Oh yeah, I had this issue on a previous example in this video sequence. I can't like interact with my command window. It's so weird. I don't know what the issue is. I'm gonna click in the command window and do control C. Yeah, and that seems to break it out. I don't know what the issue is. That's so strange. Okay, running it again, 400. There we go, now we're in stage three. One little minor thing that will not work in Octave is this right here. At least it won't work the way you want it to. What you'll need to do in Octave instead is this. I know it's more cumbersome, but it just is what it is. So this will work. This convenience, I mean, it does work in Octave. It just does something very different. What it does is it treats each of these symbols as the corresponding numeric value and then adds this numeric value to them and produces a vector of numbers as a result, which is pretty different to what MATLAB does, which is just, you know, display it out. But this will work instead. All right, so how many seconds? I don't know, one third, 123. There we go. Now it says stage two. These both work. This one works in MATLAB and Octave. This one only really does what you want it to do in MATLAB. All right, and this is just function practice. It doesn't really have anything particularly to do with if and else if and else and logicals, but I find that people just need more function practice. The solution to this exercise, this cut off the crust example, is at the bottom. If I just scroll down, it'll be right there, but I'm gonna show you how you might put it together. So the idea is that you wanna write a function that takes a matrix's input and removes the first row, last row, first column, and last column. You can think of it like you have a sandwich and you want to cut off all the crust and just leave the middle. So with the code that's set up, this is the correct output right here. And you can see that is the data without the crust. So let's go ahead and write a function, cut off the crust and see how we might accomplish this. Open a new tab, function. There is a returned value. I'm gonna name it the inner. It's the inside of the matrix and set it equal to cut off the crust, and I'll just name this matrix. Could name it sandwich or something fun, but I'm just gonna name it matrix. And we can actually do this in one line of code. Inner equals the matrix. What rows do we want? We want row two up through the last row minus one, the second to last row. And what columns do we want? Well, the exact same. So I might as well just copy and paste that. End will be flexible. When the end appears before the comma, it refers to the last row, the index of the last row. When the end appears after the comma, it refers to the index of the last column. All right, so save that. Use the suggested name, it will be correct. Now let's run it. And that's not quite right, is it? Oh yeah, it is. It's just displayed twice is the issue, right? It's displayed there and then it's displayed there. So I should have suppressed my uh, calculation right here, my indexing. So put the semicolon on there to suppress that. That is what you should do when you're writing code inside your functions. You can leave it there for testing purposes, but once you're done testing and you've got your function set up, just suppress everything inside the function. All right, so trying that again, there we go. It was just displaying twice before, and so now it's just displaying once, and that is in fact the correct result. And we could test it for other matrices. 
But that's all for the exercises in part 061, Exercises Boolean.